Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we explore the crux of why this podcast exists, education. But more importantly, we talk about the fact that owning a business does not make you an entrepreneur, and having a degree is not a prerequisite to success. I want the listeners to hopefully leave this episode with a new understanding of business or maybe a heightened understanding of something already known. But why highlight education? First, statistically speaking, the basics, money. A recent study from Georgetown University found, on average, college graduates earn $1 million more in earnings over their lifetime. Another study by the Pew Research Center found that the medium yearly income gap between high school and college graduates is around $17,500. Now let me stop there. Another thing about education is it is in fact expensive, and it is not for everyone. In general, we all know the benefits of a college degree versus a high school degree. However, what are the benefits of other educational opportunities? According to LearnHouse, in 2018, 34% of students reported that the tuition and other fees are the primary concern when choosing a college program, and the national average cost of a two-year public college education is around $3,588 per the U.S. Department of Education, and in my experience, that number is extremely low. It costs a lot more dinero, and if you are anything like my dad, then you say this saying often. Money does not grow on trees. But where am I going with this? Why am I telling you education is so important but expensive? Because of our source of education needs to change, and we need to innovate where and how it is consumed. According to Get Smart, 81% of high school dropouts state that teaching of real-life skills would have kept them in school. Meanwhile, 45% of trade school students say educators use real-world examples to help them understand their class materials. Kids are simply dropping out of school because we're not giving them real-world solutions. Now, sadly, there is another glaring statistic we must discuss. Students who major in education have a medium starting salary of $38,148. That's right. Our teacher's medium salary a $20,000 degree in in in-state or roughly $46,000 for private schools are at times being paid less than their degree cost. Actual income for the degrees will depend on other factors such as individual work experience, the actual salary included in the job offer, and even the place where you work. On average though, professionals working in these careers make just over $30,000 annually at the start of their careers. We have to do better not only for our teachers and for our students, but for all of our futures. We have to stop making trade schools appear to be subpar education. It is not. And getting a degree does not always mean success. However, collaborating, observing, doing, reading, listening to one another, those are all free educational opportunities we must take advantage of. And to our teachers, thank you. We need you. In fact, we need more of you. Teaching and learning are vital arteries to life's innovation, inside and outside a business quorum. I would encourage my listeners to try this simple but difficult task. Brush your teeth with the opposite hand. Try it. It will not be easy. But if you do this for the entire week, you may be surprised at how much you learn. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. My next guest experience spans all facets of the startup trenches. From Digital Health, Portland Startup Week, and Latino, and the founder of Latino Founders, a professional organization empowering the next generation of Latino entrepreneurs, please welcome the Director of Student Innovation at Portland State University, Juan Barraza. Gabriel, thank you for having me. Great to be here and excited to to take a deep dive on entrepreneurship and innovation. Yeah, I'm really excited because you actually work in academia. You educate entrepreneurs. 
right? The future entrepreneur. So I'm really excited about this. But first, let's get a little background. Who is Juan? Tell the world who is Juan. Yeah, thank you. Born and raised in Mexico City. I spent my, my life uh, in, in a very cosmopolitan, beautiful city. Moved to Oregon about 26, six. Nobody told me about the rain. <laughs> So, so we're moving from Mexico and you realize Oregon's a little wet, huh? Yeah, that, that's <laughs> definitely uh, a change of pace. And it's not like it's a torrential rain, it's that drizzle, right? Yep. The constant yep. constant drizzle, um, the overcast clouds. But that's the reason we have such a green environment, trees and everything grows so fast and, yep. and beautiful. So I have done a lot of ventures, created businesses in the past. Lifestyle businesses about 10, 11 years ago, my last venture, that was the first time I needed to raise capital. Okay. Created this company that if you are familiar with having family uh, that has limited English proficiency, mm -hmm. when you go to the hospital, you have to wait for an interpreter. Right. Right. Or you bring a, a cousin, uh, your son, mm -hmm. uh, somebody that speaks the language and is, is able to interpret for you with the medical providers. So working uh, in healthcare, I realized that that was a big need and it's still a big need in our community. We decided to launch um, 10 years too early a company that will bring a certified medical interpreter real time via video conferencing to assist the collaboration and that conversation at the emergency room, at the hospital, the medical provider pre-check appointment for your kids. And we develop a pilot um, with the existing technology back in the day. Many of us are using Zoom day in and day out now due to the pandemic that we are going through. But we were one of the first companies that actually used their API, the backend, to power our, our, our solution. We, we ran out of capital, and just like any other entrepreneur. You have a certain amount of capital to be able, be able to figure out what is the problem you're solving, how you're going to solve it. And then how you scale. And the scaling piece, is, that was very difficult. Healthcare is prime and for innovation, and but there's so much red tape. Uh, HIPAA compliance, yeah. uh, adoption and everything. There's a lot of checks and balances. If you don't have the right clear model to monetization, is is definitely uh, it's a no-go. So when we closed the company back in 2015, at the end of 2015, I had my office at the PSU Business Accelerator down in the uh, Portland State campus. The director of the Center for Entrepreneurship uh, at that time, so much technology and so many resources that are widely available that makes the college experience, the university experience so much better than when we went to school. Yeah. Do you, so what, what do you feel like was your biggest learning point from your failed venture? Definitely figure out who's going to pay for your product or service, right? You can have a great product, great value proposition that will benefit a lot of people, but you don't find a way to get it funded. And I say get it funded is using the, our application for video conferencing with medical providers. It is a mandate, uh, Title VI, that requires that. Any healthcare provider needs to provide a certified medical interpreter, but there's an unfunded mandate and there's no clear ways to for hospitals to get reimbursed for that. So that that brings the adoption uh, very difficult because somebody needs to pay for it. Yeah. So just whatever you build, make sure that somebody's gonna pay for it. It's the right individual. Yeah, and I give the example uh, if you have kids and you go to the uh, to the store, you will see the candy. It's perfectly positioned right to that level of the kids. Yeah. <laughs> they are the target. They are the target consumer. Yep. But you are the one who pays paying for that. So using that analogy, make sure that yes, you identify the perfect user for your product or service. But you also you need to figure out who's gonna pay for that. Once you know that element, it's a lot easier to replicate because now you know what is the path. And the second piece is ask people how they're gonna use your product. Sometimes we build things that we like. That it's a great hobby to have, but no market of, uh, no market to grow. It's just you and your friends that will buy it, but nobody else. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Now, did you feel like when you were growing up that you always wanted to be an entrepreneur, or was that something that you kind of grew into? We didn't have a name for it growing up. Yeah, yeah good we point. didn't have a name for, for growing up. Uh, back in Mexico, we called it emprendedores, and that wasn't uh, even until this day. It's not uh, such a common phrase. But we knew a lot of people that were doing businesses. I was fortunate that growing up, I had my parents that were very entrepreneurial and entrepreneurship and business creation has allowed my family to leapfrog uh, economic mobility. And 
I grew up, my mom started businesses just from, from her kitchen table. Or oh, my dad, I started a wholesale route, supply, uh, grocery stores uh, on the weekends, right? And I was right there with him in the, in the cargo van, going and meeting the, the store owners and selling them products. So for me and my siblings, seeing that firsthand experience, that is what has planted the seed for uh, creating a business down the road, that having a business would allow you to bring higher income to your family and provide a lot more than a day-to-day job, right? Which is nothing wrong with that. So right. some folks do great work in, in industry, So, but some folks wants to have that flexibility to, to explore and create new things and entrepreneurship is for them. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit about the Portland State Student Innovation Department. What, what exactly is Portland State Student Innovation? Yeah, so at the Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, Portland State University Center for Entrepreneurship, we've been around for the last nine years. From the beginning, we were very clear in our mission. We want to make sure that we create a pathway for the students, faculty, and staff at the university to explore what it's like to be an innovator, an inventor, an entrepreneur. doesn't matter if you are a freshman or you just graduated or you pursue a master's or a PhD. Everybody has an idea along the way during your time in, uh, in campus. So we create these on-ramps where we had different programming that would allow you to explore an idea. Maybe you just wanted to know if there's a market opportunity for your idea. So you participate in one of our weekend events, or maybe you already did that, or you are farther along than, than many, and you want to figure out if can you build it. So we have a student competitions like a Clean Tech Challenge or Invent Oregon, nice. where we provide you a little bit of funding. Mm-hmm. Many times, in this case, we're the first money in, we provide a little bit of funding, 90 days to prototype an idea. And that's a very compressed timeline where under a lot of pressure, you are able to figure out this. you have something in your hands, or it's just a hobby. Then... For the students that go through our program, for most of our programs, the expectation is not for them to launch a company or create a, a venture, but some of them are. And many of our students will go into industry, will do great work, uh, but some of them decide to either file for a patent, launch a company from the get-go. And we have the our student incubator, we call the Cube, where if you already have an, an idea product, you prototype it, you validate your market, you have a little bit of funding, either from friends and family or an actual product they're selling, uh, then the student incubator is for you. And with that one, we flip the formula and we want to poke holes to your idea very fast to figure out what you need to do to take it to market and get you as, pos- as close as possible to launching the company and scaling. Nice. You know, I think you, you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, the word entrepreneur is actually new. Right. And it has, it's still relatively new, I think, even in the um, in the United States and in different places. It's a relatively it's been a while. What would you say is the definition of entrepreneurship? For, for me, based on my experience, you see uh, a problem in the market and your personal life uh, that will benefit people. And you try to figure out how to solve that problem. You tap into your network of friends or, or you close a circle of coworkers and figure out who has the skill sets to help you build a solution and solve that problem. So for me, an entrepreneur is a problem solver that is able to connect the dots and bring together the skill sets and the know-how to solve a big problem in our, in a, in a person's life, in our community, or around the world. And you don't have to have all the rocket science education. All you have to do is being able to bring people together. So it's a connector for me. Entrepreneur is a connector. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, at the start of this that you had uh, your own company and then and you closed the doors in 2015, I believe it was. Do you currently still run a company? I don't. Uh, right now, my main focus, and I will say that with a grain of salt, I, I don't have a private uh, company owned by me right now. With that said, working at the Center for Entrepreneurship with the Clean Tech Challenge competition, with the Invent Oregon competition, which is a statewide prototyping competition for any student in Oregon. In a way, those are our ventures, our companies, right? Uh, we are able to bring invention education, teach our students, uh, college students across the state. They have a background in STEM, science, engineering, business, or, or college of arts. Bring them together and then just put them in that pathway, in that sandbox, where they can learn how to rapid prototype and idea and take it to market. So in a way that is a there is a business. Yeah. But there's a more focus on the impact and the social entrepreneurship uh, with the social entrepreneurship lens. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. You know, you're coming from academia. What other programs do you may be aware of that folks out there may be unaware of are available to them that may be starting out a new business? Are there programs or educational things that um, folks at home should be aware of? 
Look at the university, um, any of the universities across the, across the state. They have the Center for Entrepreneurship, right? Um, so it will, if you are a student in one of the co- community college or four-year universities uh, across Oregon, look at your Center for Entrepreneurship from um, University of Oregon, uh, the Lilith Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, University of Portland, the France Center. Uh, here in Portland State, we have the Center for Entrepreneurship. Look at those programs to figure out how to get support outside the higher education uh, ecosystem. You have programs like the Portland Incubator Experiment. You have Built Oregon. They, they are helping entrepreneurs to figure out how to take the direct-to-consumer manufacturing products to market. Or you have a combination of technology, software, the Portland Incubator Experiment is a good place to start. If you only have a recipe, um, we call it recipe to market. PCC has a great programs down at the waterfront by, by OMSI that will be able to figure out how to take the recipe to market. Then you have Portland Mercado and Hacienda down in, uh, in Southeast that they will do the same for any direct-to-consumer product that has a recipe that needs to be co packed and mass-produced. Those are the places that will start. Okay, And on top of that, there's a lot of resources online that will be able to get you started. Depends where you are. The darling of the entrepreneurship is software companies. Those easy to get funded, uh, quotation mark in the easy piece. Uh, but people understand them better because require low investment and it's not capital intensive. When you start getting into manufacturing, production, and current inventory, it gets a little bit more complicated. Why is that? You got to carry inventory, figure out supply chain, distribution channels. You got to train people. You got to have a space and facility to fabricate, right? So you can have 40,000 square feet of manufacturing space to launch a company that will bring a million, $2 million in sales, for example, every year. And where a software company, all you need is a group of five or three people in a 200 square foot office. All they do is line of code. And the once they figure out the what the software is doing, all they have to do is put it out there on the internet and they can rapidly grow because they have millions and millions of consumers. The supply chain and distribution is totally different than a direct-to-consumer. Once you have like a you dessert, you salsa, or you manufacturing shoes or hats, then you got to figure out who's going to distribute them, uh, get into the different markets. It gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah, and I think you kind of highlighted several things that young business owners probably don't think about when they're first getting into a, a business venture. What advice do you give some of the students that are coming into the program? What advice do you give them about entrepreneurship? Get to know your consumer. Before you build anything, before you do anything, you got to do your research. And the research in different aspects. Uh, of course, you got to look at the market opportunity. What is your value proposition? What is unique about your idea that will differentiate you from the rest of the competitors in the market? And even when I hear, and often I hear saying this, that we are nobody else is doing this where the only ones doing it. Unless you develop a new kind of technology, biotech, uh, engineer something that truly nobody's done, you will have a competitor out there. So to be able to understand what makes you different from the market, that is one. But then the part that we miss very often is actually talking to people before we build a product or a service or doesn't matter if it's software or it's manufacturer. Uh, you got to talk to people and ask them and observe them. How will you use it? How it tastes? How it feels and fits? Because once you get their feedback, you're gonna ha- you're gonna be closer to a better market fit where people actually from the get go they will buy your product from day one, and as soon as they grab it, they wear it, taste it, use it, it will feel right for them, and from there you can start building. So before you do anything, do your research. The easy one is the market. The hardest one is actually going and talking talking to people. How will they use something that you planning to build or manufacture or yeah. create? Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of funny. We actually, in a previous episode, discussed, you know, the difference between primary research and secondary research, right? And the importance of that, because it is important to engross yourself into your consumer to really identify what their needs are to create a product to address those needs. Because if you create a product that's addressing your own needs, that's great, but your needs may not be the needs of everyone else. And that's correct. I mean, uh, if 
all you like is wearing black and blue, it's going to be a limited amount of people that will like to wear black and blue. And it's a lot more neat and different points of view. So, yeah. Now, one of the things you've said, you said it at the beginning of this uh, conversation, you recently said it again, is value proposition. Can you kind of explain to the listeners at home what value proposition is? What makes you unique, right? What is your product unique? And what problem are you solving? To give you an example, some great company that's here growing in Oregon is Brassy Bites. It's Brazilian cheese bread. So you are from South America. You have the pleasure of growing up with a Brazilian cheese bread, which is uh, has a center of gooey cheese on it. And once it comes out of the oven, you cannot stop eating them. This sounds delicious. <laughs> What's it, does. Already? <laughs> it does, right? So they figured out how to manufacture it and replicate the recipe that has been generation over generation. But their value proposition, rather than going to the main market to the beginning, was all their ingredients that was to appeal to the gluten-free individuals. It's a great number of folks out there that cannot eat gluten. So they go to specialized stores to buy those products that are gluten-free to be able to enjoy the things that you and I take for granted in a day-to-day meal. So that was the value proposition. I started with a gluten-free market play. They got into those markets. It took a while for them to get there, but once they hone in on that demographic, they were able to span uh, to the mass market. And now you can go to Costco uh, or any convenience stores and buy Brassy Bites. And, uh, but their value proposition is they're healthy, gluten-free. And the folks that need that kind of meal, they will go and gravitate for that. And all of us will fall. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. You know, you, you've mentioned you started your own business uh, and then you closed the doors. You're now in academia. Looking back on everything, what advice would you give a younger one? Just what I describe. Do your market research, right? And also figure out who's going to pay for it. Could be a great idea, but there's no way that you can get it funded. And as a funded is, people will not be able to buy it as easily. It might be just a moot point, right? You can still build it, but it's going to be for a few. Second one, uh, build a team. Entrepreneurship is a very long winded road that has a lot of stop and goes. Hollywood and Silicon Valley has given us this perception that funding a company, creating a company is so cool and exciting, which it is to a point, but they forget to mention all the battles you had to fight and day in and day out. It's a very lonely road, so it's better done with a team that complements your skill set. The earlier you can bring somebody that complements the need uh, or brings the skill set that your company needs, the better, right? So if you as forte is marketing and business development and you need somebody with science or engineering background, try to find the individual as soon as possible. If you're for this engineering and science and you can build the product, you got to bring the business development and grow the team from there. Do your homework and make sure that you have a path to monetization and build your team early. Then surround yourself by other founders because then you can talk to folks that can relate to your experience. I can tell my wife and friends what it's like to build a business and the heartaches and pressures that this entails, they can relate to that. They can be sympathized with the, what I'm going through, but another founder will definitely will be able to, A, get it right away, and B, provide you with the advice and maybe a solution for your problems. Yeah. Would, would you do anything different? I would definitely would have, I would have brought a technical co-founder earlier. Could expedite it to find out if we have something there. I mean, self-taught uh, programming and HTML and other computer software to just to be able to build the first, first prototype. I could have definitely done a lot of things faster uh, with a technical co-founder on, on board. Nice. So for the folks at home that might be interested in learning about the Portland State uh, Entrepreneurship Program, how do they get a hold? How do they find information? How do they get a hold of you if they want to contact you? Very simple. Uh, you want to go to Portland State University and just Google Portland State University Center for Entrepreneurship. That's an easy way to get a hold of the programs that we do at the center. If you're in Twitter, just look for Juan Barraza at Juan Barraza on Twitter. That's easy. And I can share my email that you can put later on the on the podcast. So. Perfect. Perfect. Juan Barraza. Thank you so much for joining me on the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For those at home, thank you and good night. <laughs>